This is KGW News at 5. And we begin with some breaking news on I-5 tonight north of Wilsonville. A tractor trailer flipped over and caused a major backup on the interstate, as you can see there. Things are moving again, but it has been slow going. At least 31 cows were inside that trailer. Some ran free in the area, others were hurt. Some even died after falling off a bridge. Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue says the truck driver is okay, and the cows are being herded to exit 283 to get on another truck. We're going to let you know more throughout the newscast and on KGW.com. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us here. I'm Galen Etlin. Now with all the tough news that we've been through, we do have to celebrate the wins as well, right? And the Shamrock Run is back. Thousands of runners lined up for the 44th annual event this morning after it was canceled and held virtually the last two years because of COVID-19. Our Christelle Kumwe takes us there to share the excitement. The Shamrock Run made a triumphant return Sunday at the Tom McCall waterfront in true Portland fashion. It wouldn't be the Shamrock Run Portland without a little bit of rain. The rain did not dampen the organizer's spirit. Then crews waited a long time for this comeback. This is the first Shamrock Run Portland in over a thousand days. The last live in person race was in 2019. On Sunday, more than 15,000 runners from 19 countries and 46 states donned their best green fit for the 44th Shamrock Run Portland. We haven't had it the past few years, so it feels really special to be back. And Carrie Dimoff was back at it on a mission. She won the women's 5K race. It's windy this morning and cold, um, and the 5K has a decent sized hill in it, so we just all had to run super tough today. The race kicks off the traditional beginning of the running season for most. It's my son. <laughs> my dad. <laughs> and an opportunity to bond for this father son duo and first time race participants Shane and John Lee. Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, he blew me away at the end, but uh, <laughs> it was great. At any pace, it was a chance to get back out in the community. Just being cooped up at, at home for the last two years. And this year, I mean, just being around all these people, I feel more alive, I guess. A feeling shared by runners and organizers as the St. Patrick's Day running tradition returns to Portland. In the same weekend that the mask mandates are going away, everything just feels really full circle. From the start of the pandemic, we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel for the end of the pandemic. Christelle Kumwe, KGW News. Good vibes, right? Across town, too, in Northeast Portland was the 33rd St. Patty's Day Parade. That event was held after that two year pandemic break as well. Dozens of people lined the streets to see groups like the Royal Rosarians and Cub Scouts March, along with fire trucks and police cars driving through the Grant Park neighborhood. And of course, the sound of bagpipes, as you heard earlier, filled the air. Very exciting times despite the rain. Yeah, Meteorologist Joe Neary joins us now. The sound of bagpipes and the sound of some rain. And uh, yeah, it was a, a very wet start out there. But again, out there tonight, the rest of your Sunday night, we're going to start to dry out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then after midnight, Galen will be seeing another round of showers. In the last week of winter, uh, yeah, we are going to be seeing some uh, basically wet conditions here the next several days. And that means the snow uh, showers will continue a little bit here the next couple of hours. But uh, here's a look at the weather headlines right now. We're going to be drying out tonight and then showers move in uh, basically throughout tomorrow morning. It's not going to be a complete washout throughout the day. Tomorrow there will be some windows of some dry conditions at times and then the heaviest amount of rain will be arriving basically after sunset tomorrow and into early Tuesday morning. So on the radar, you can start to see a little bit of some dry pockets here and there. With that said, there will still be some light showers at times as you get ready to wrap up your Sunday night and you travel over the mountain passes. That winter weather advisory that was in effect for basically 3000 feet and higher earlier today has expired just a couple of minutes ago. We've seen about four inches of new snow uh, throughout Timberline Lodge about uh, about seven or eight throughout the uh, higher elevations near uh, Mount Hood Meadows uh, earlier today. So we're going to continue to see those snow showers off and on here the next couple of hours, but uh, you'll start to see the snow really pile up basically by the uh, late Tuesday and into Wednesday. I'll talk more about that in your detailed forecast, but let's look into tomorrow. So like I said, we'll start to see some drier conditions heading into your uh, 
Sunday night and early tomorrow morning, but right around um, I'd say the morning commute we will start to see some passing showers at times. Some of the snow showers I think for tomorrow will be throughout the Washington Cascades. And then as we go into Monday afternoon, here we are at one o'clock. We'll start to see some drier weather up and down the I-5 corridor. Our next round of showers though will be hitting the Oregon coast by lunchtime tomorrow. And then again, after sunset, we'll start to see those showers really increase tomorrow night and into Tuesday and expect to see some heavier downpours heading into Tuesday as well. And some models are showing basically from uh, tomorrow all the way into Wednesday. Parts of the metro area could be seeing close to an inch of rain and we do that. We could easily see close to where we should be in terms of monthly uh, rainfall amounts. I'll talk more about that as well in just a few minutes. All right. Good to know, Joe. We'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, let's get you an update now on the fight in Ukraine. Russia is attacking a training base near the Polish border, killing at least 35 people. A hundred others are hurt as well. Ukrainian officials say the Russians launched 30 cruise missiles, missiles rather, and Ukraine shot down 22 of them. This was the westernmost attack since Russia invaded the country from the southeast and north three weeks ago. That area near Poland had been a relatively safe haven for people trying to run from the violence. In the past, U.S. and NATO troops have trained in that base at, that Russia attacked. Meanwhile, White House officials are doubling down on not sending fighter jets to support Ukraine. The military, the Pentagon, uh, sees the, the MiGs, the fighter jets, as offensive weapons. But the key thing here is that President Biden uh, looked at the assessment of our intelligence community, took the advice of his military commanders, consulted with his NATO allies, and ultimately determined that the cost-benefit analysis uh, did not justify flying fighter planes from a U.S. base in Germany mm -hmm. into contested airspace uh, in Eastern Europe. Now, today we learned of at least one American who died in this conflict. 50-year-old journalist Brent Renaud died in a suburb of Kiev, who is producing a story about refugees. An Oregon icon is also gone tonight. Writer, businessman, political consultant, and longtime Oregonian Jerry Frank has passed away. The Frank family's roots date back to 1857. Jerry's great-great-grandfather established a one-man storefront and the riverfront of Portland, and that eventually turned into Meyer and Frank. That's the company Jerry eventually took over and led into the 1960s. The World War II veteran later became involved in politics with Senator Mark Hatfield and eventually became his chief of staff. I spoke with Jerry's friend, who's also the executive director of the Oregon Historical Society. Nobody loved Oregon, was more dedicated to Oregon, every corner of this state than he was. What message do you hope his legacy can carry forward. One person can make a difference. He made a difference in so many ways for so many people, for so many causes, for so many communities, just through sheer uh, willpower and enthusiasm and perseverance. You could look in every corner of Oregon and if there was something good happening, Jerry was somehow involved. Now, Jerry was also a longtime contributor to the Oregonian and authored a guidebook called Jerry Frank's Oregon. He passed away peacefully this morning at the age of 98.